In this lab, we'll be learning some concepts and some practical skills for taking blood pressures. By the end of the lab, you'll be able to understand what blood pressure is. You'll be able to identify components of a stethoscope and a sphygmomanometer, two common instruments to take blood pressures. And you'll be able to demonstrate the proper techniques and procedures for taking blood pressures. Most of you know that blood pressure is the pressure exerted against the arteries by blood. In other words, the more blood pushes against the vessel walls, the greater the pressure. There are two main components of blood pressure. Systolic blood pressure is the higher pressure that occurs during left ventricular contraction of the cardiac cycle. The highest pressures occur during systole as blood is ejected into the aorta and out into the periphery of subsequent arteries of the body. Diastolic pressure is the lower pressure it occurs during the left ventricular refilling of the cardiac cycle. This follows systole. During diastole, the ventricles fill with more blood and the peripheral pressures fall until more blood is ejected during systole. Now remember, even during diastole, there are still pressures against the arteries. It's important to take blood pressure since we know that prolonged high blood pressure is linked with cardiovascular disease. Some call hypertension a silent killer. On the other hand, hypotension, which is low blood pressure, is usually an indicator of injury to the body caused by myocardial infarction, heart attack, shock, or drugs. Here we have some stethoscopes, the listening devices when taking blood pressures. These are the earpieces, and note how they're angled to fit into your ear canals. When you fit them, the earpieces should be pointed towards the nose. If you don't have your own stethoscope, it's good practice to clean the earpieces with the alcohol before fitting them. The headset is connected to tubing down to the stem, which is connected to the bell and diaphragm. Some stethoscopes have a high and low frequency, thus the bell can be rotated. And some stethoscopes are just set to a single frequency. Blood pressure cuffs come in all different sizes. Here we have a small, medium, and large. And the sizes are typically noted on the cuff. In choosing the proper size, about 80% of the cuff bladder should cover the arm. The bladder is the inflatable portion of the cuff. Too large of a bladder will underestimate, and too small of a bladder will overestimate one's blood pressure. From the cuff, we have tubing that connects to the inflation bulb and air release valve. To control the flow of air, when inflated in the cuff, you turn it to the right, which is clockwise, and to release the air, turn it to the left, which is counterclockwise. One common mistake I see students making is that they try to make that valve too tight. You just need to tighten it until it stops. In the other tube, we have the aneroid gauge. That's the needle that points to the numbers as it's inflated and deflated. And these numbers are in units of millimeters of mercury, and you will note that they are in increments of 20, with the larger lines in increments of 10, and the smallest in increments of 2. This whole thing is called a sphygmomanometer. Before taking blood pressures, be sure your patient sit comfortably for at least five minutes. The arms should not be crossed, the feet should be flat on the floor, and the legs should be uncrossed as well. Position yourself to the left of the patients and in front of them. It's best to be near the corner of the table. Be sure the upper arm is at the level of the heart. Always fit the cuff on the left side and as far up on the arm to keep the distal portion exposed, which is about three centimeters or an inch above the elbow. Also note the position of the cuff in relation to the brachial artery. You can then clip the aneroid gauge to the cuff. You can have the patient hold the aneroid gauge or you can clip it to the patient's sleeve. Again, the arm should be covered with about 80% of the cuff bladder, so if it takes more than this, then the larger cuff is needed, and if it takes less, then the smaller cuff is needed. Once you have the cuff and gauge in place, you're now ready to take your patient's blood pressure. You want to begin by cradling the arm under the elbow, as this will keep the stethoscope in place. Notice how the bell is medial to the antecubital space since the brachial artery is closest to the skin in this position. I'll use my right hand to close the valve, and again, be sure not to over-tighten it, because then you will not be able to open it. It just needs to be tightened until the knob stops turning. Now comes the time to inflate the cuff. Quickly and forcefully squeeze the cuff to about 30 millimeters of mercury over the patient's normal blood pressure or until there's a disappearance of the palpated systolic pressure. Immediately open the valve 
after inflating to control for the release of air so that the needle is lowering about two to three millimeters of mercury per second. During this time, you are listening for sounds. So what are these sounds that we're listening for when we're taking blood pressures? They're called Korotkov sounds, named after a Russian doctor who first noticed them in the early 1900s. As we're deflating the cuff pressure, the first sounds that we hear mark the systolic blood pressures. In phase two, these sounds are still very much audible. However, if they disappear as a clue to you that the cuff is being deflated a little too slowly, and this can underestimate blood pressures because you may not mark the systolic until this point. In phase three, the thumping sounds are still there. In phase four, when they suddenly become muffled, that's when we mark diastolic blood pressures during exercise. During rest, however, we use phase five to mark diastolic blood pressures, and this is when the cork cough sounds completely disappear. Now remember, you're listening for sounds. The numbers on the gauge tell us at what levels of pressure systolic and diastolic occur. Don't forget that immediately upon inflating, you want to begin to deflate the cuff at a rate of two to three millimeters of mercury per second. You'll notice the needles start to jump around the time the sounds are heard. It's important not to focus solely on the needle when recording blood pressures, but noting where the needle is when the sounds are heard. Once diastolic pressure has been noted, immediately deflate the cuff all the way. I want you to note that while you're being taught to cradle the elbow at rest, this is not necessary as the patient can just rest the arm on the table. However, I do want you to be familiar with cradling since you will have to do it during exercise. Again, once you have the diastolic pressure, immediately release all of the air and take the cuff off the arm. If you need to take multiple blood pressure measurements, be sure to wait about 30 to 60 seconds between each reading. You now know what blood pressure is. You can identify the two main instruments of taking blood pressures, the stethoscope and the sphygmomanometer, and you understand the proper techniques and procedures for taking the blood pressures. And this concludes our blood pressure video, and thank you for watching.